you know, even the predestined things. That means he knows it, it's not just something that the future is open. He, uh, it's because again, you're not an open theist, you're partial. Right, but so it you, doesn't say he knows the beginning from the end. He declares the end from the beginning, which yeah, means, but it means he knows. If I declare something, I know it's going to happen. No, he doesn't. It doesn't say he declares every blessed thing that's going to happen. No, but but let's let, forget that. Let's just say he he does one thing, the cross. If that's true, and this is why you call yourself a partial open theist, because partially you're Calvinist in the sense that in in, in the worldview that God predestines everything, but you don't you 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 know say only a certain things, but you do see that in the scriptures. Just like Calvinists, when I go to the Old Testament and see God predestining and, and talking about prophecies coming to pass, you're like, yes, that's God's sovereignty. That's God predestining, doing what he wants to get done to fulfill what he had already predestined. And we both agree there. But the problem is, is when you get into the other side where you talk about God doesn't know the future of everything, now you're like, well, yeah, because God doesn't know those things because that doesn't exist. If God can know one thing in the future, why can't he know everything? And there's why? A very, and, 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 there's a very simple reason why. Because there's plenty of things that God wants to happen. And when he says, I'm going to make this happen. Now, this is the way you read the Bible, right? Like, this is how it reads. God decides, I'm going to do something. He declares it. However, there are plenty of times in the Bible where men do certain things. And then God says, I changed my mind. And it literally says, and God relented or God repented. Now, what that means is that God like me, kind, so. of, kind of God predestined to do something and then changed his mind. So God can do that. Now, God can't do that if he is in the Calvinistic eternal now state that Calvinists say he's in, where he's not in a, uh, where he's like, everything is present to God. Because that's where it comes from. It comes from Augustine. If that's true, then God could never change his mind. Because he's seeing everything as if it already happened. He's in the eternal now. But that's not the way the Bible reads. See, all I'm trying to do is point out the way God is portraying himself to us in the Bible. Because that's what he wants us to read to figure out who he is. So if you say he's outside of time, all I'm saying is that's not what God wants you to think about him. You came up with that on your own or because somebody taught it to you. I mean, but do you see like what I'm saying, like with Abraham? So when I take your position, I would say, okay, that means even though God is predestining, you know, the lineage of Jesus Christ, and because I'm going back, I'm, I'm reading the Bible from it had already happened. So I look at this and I look at Genesis and I'm like, wow, so God, if he does predestine things, he, it's like he could just change it. Even though he predestined it, do you believe that God predestined something and then changed that predestining of it? Of course, it happens all the time in scripture. Give me an example. If he says, I'm going to destroy Nineveh, and then Jonah goes and preaches to Nineveh, and God repents of the That's destruction. True. But yeah. is that, it, but now in your mind, was yeah. that a predestiny from the foundation of the world? Oh, they were, they were totally, but yeah, they were, they were going to oh. get wrecked, and then yeah, they repented. So, but for Matthew's view, because if God, when he said, just like the cross, like there's no way possible for the cross not to happen because it was predestined. Do you believe that the cross could have also, just like the example you gave with Nineveh, not happened? Zach, you're taking one thing that God did not want to change his mind, no matter what, and you're making it a paradigm and you can't do that. There's no. tons and tons of things that God changed his mind on. That. All I, I'm saying is that shows that God operates in time. Or it can show an anthropomorphic <laughs> sense because here's the thing. God, just like I said, I mean, I know you didn't answer the question. Do you believe that the cross could have also not happened just like the example that you gave? Yes, God could have changed the cross. He didn't want to. Okay. Fix your mic, Zach. What happened? 
fix your mic. Yeah, like again, you, uh, you have Sorry. this really bad thing with the like, psh, 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 psh. <laughs> like all this stuff, like noise going on. It's like somebody's flipping papers or something. I don't know. No, it's his mic clicking. Yeah, it's because he leaves his one headphone out or whatever. <laughs> He I mean, showed us the other I, night what he does. I I definitely understand your position for sure. I just still think it's that, like I can see what you're saying. I just, I just don't accept it. Of course, I just see like again, it just doesn't make any sense that like, in my view, if God says this is going to happen, like especially from the before the foundation of the world, like the mm -hmm. example of Christ, then that's going to happen, for sure. But Zach, like, that, there's no that's way not, around that. In my no, mind, that's, no, no, that's not true. That. What you're doing is you're you're saying that once God says something, it's impossible for Him to change His mind. In your, what, what I'm you trying said. to say is, in your perspective, but like when you had brought up the cross, mm -hmm. so now that you said that, yeah, the cross could have not happened. Now I go, okay. So now you're being consistent on that. So now you're good. Well, all. All but I thought you were gonna. I thought you were gonna say because I remember you had said before that only open theists say that the cross could not have happened. But you say that no, the cross. Like I remember before, you have said the cross was happening no matter what. No, here's what I'm saying. I want to be pretty clear. God definitely predestined things. I mean, that's what it literally says. You go to you go to uh, Romans eight. You go to Ephesians uh, one. It's telling you that God predestined things. Now, I think Calvinists take that wrong and they say, and they think that God, it says God's predestining everything. No, it says God predestined these certain things. Uh, but so God can predestine things. And then as, as history uh, transpires, God can change his mind. And we see that happening in scripture lots of times. But the cross is definitely something that we know God didn't want to change his mind. So in other words, if God says this, this, let's say God lays out 10 things that are going to happen, but eight of them happen and two of them he changed his mind on. What that means is that God could have changed his mind on any of them. Because the moment God changes his mind on one single solitary thing, that means that God did not predestine everything from the foundation and then hit the start button and let it roll. It means he's operating in time. Now, you can, you can, ima you can imagine that even though God is euphemistically uh, or appearing to operate in time, because he does appear to operate in time, you know, he talks with man, he changes his mind, you know, you could say that even though God appears to be that way in the Bible, he's really not. He's outside of time. It's not written that he's outside of time in the Bible. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. I just choose to believe it because I was taught it in church. You, I can, hate do, you can do that if you want. I'm just telling you, it's not biblical. You got to watch out for that. But I will welcome Bible Scribe. Welcome. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Hey, David. Hey, David. Hey, guys. But, so I really want somebody to give me a verse that says that God, or that proves that God is not in time. Just one. Well, I think it comes down to the definition of time. Like I said, my, my definition of time is time began when God began. In the beginning. That's when time started. Now, is there time outside of time where God was before creation? Was there time when God was just God without the creation being in place? I don't know. That's incomprehensible. But from our perspective, from my perspective, time started in the beginning. And we know God was before the beginning. So what was that before? Was that time also? I don't know. But from our perspective, our time started then. And so from that from that perspective, God is outside right. of my but time. Now, but now, Alan, you believe in free will, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. So, so, so answer me this. I mean, you know what the Calvinist says about the eternal now state of God, right? Right. That, so, they, so they say that God is existing 
outside of time and he sees the past, present, and future as if it's all happening now. And that, the Calvinist says that that's the reason God knows the future. And they call it foreknowledge. The problem, the problem that they have is that foreknowledge means that you know something before it happens. That places God in a past, present, and future. Like, it, it places God in time, because if he knows it before it happens, you know, so it's a little contradictory, but if, well, it's not you, believe, Go ahead. if you believe that God is, um, it, it has given man a free will, then that means, and, and you believe that God knows what man is going to do with his free will, then can you describe to me like how God would know that? Is it because he's outside of time, like the Calvinists would say? I believe, yeah, I believe he, he's not only outside of time, but he's also in time. He's, so he's both. He's outside and in. Remember, he, he is, was he there bound, by, is he bound by it? I think that's what Matthew said. He's not asked, bound but. by anything. Um, so he's outside of time. So, like, time is just like a mechanism. He can, like, I just believe that forward. I'm not a Calvinist, but uh, I just, because I believe in free will, but uh, I, believe well, I believe in free God will. God just too. knows what the decision is going to be. But I don't have What's like, that? Like, Gareth. You know, like there's certain free will things that we can do, but there's other, you know, things we can't do. Like I can't just like free will teleport myself to wherever you are right now. Like, <laughs> ain't gonna happen. Well, yeah, we're not talking about that. It's just yeah, a, well, we're, of course we have human limitations, but that's a different <clears throat> subject than whether you have free will or not. With within the confines I just, I just, of yeah, of I think the ability. confusion the confusion comes because I see our time in which God created in the beginning. And then I see God outside of that because he's the one that created it. He can't be in it and, and restricted by it. If he created it, he can't be. That's well, illogical. No, I would right. actually agree. I would actually argue, argue the opposite. Now, if Jesus, okay. if let, all right, if you're a Trinitarian and you say that the second person of the Trinity came and became a man, then he did that at a certain point in time. Therefore, God must be in time. Otherwise, God would always have been a man forever in eternity past. And God wasn't a man. He became a man in the fullness of time. Right, in our time. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's hard to comprehend, but he was outside it, but he's also in it. Yeah, like Matthew, like I'm kind of understanding what he's saying. So... So if we have God, bef like God was obviously God before Genesis 1-1, correct? Right. Okay, so let's just say you're right. Time, he's already in time. Time is ticking, you know, for him. You know, it's infinite. Whatever, whatever month, year, date, whatever date it was when God started it. But then all of a sudden he says, let there be light. And then boom, creation starts. Couldn't there be like another like calendar started right then so you do have two times that are running like just like me like i came into this world in march 21st 1990 but the world was already you know living before that right so you could say the world's calendar versus my life calendar so you kind of have is, two different you know but you know what's calendars. interesting um i thought a lot about this when you think about the word time for a minute like Time is really something that you have to like meditate, concentrate on because we use the word, like you just said, time was running or time was ticking, right? Time doesn't tick. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean though. I'm no, not no, trying to I know it. exactly what you mean, but I'm just simply pointing out that we, we, we use the word time wrongly so often that I think we brainwash ourselves into thinking that it's this thing like that that's running and we have to like, we have to run along with it or like time is like a tunnel that you travel through. So I then mean, how would you define, so like what, you know, he, what Alan was saying. So you have God before he created. So whatever he's in, which is this non-ticking, 
non-running, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. it's time. But then he created everything, you know, at, at one particular point within his existence. So you can't I, see that there's two, two time periods there. Like, oh, obviously I've lived longer than the creation. You know, and I'm out. over here. And draw, then, if you, let's say you draw, um, let's say you draw a timeline right? Which mm-hmm. people do all the time. Here's a timeline on a piece of paper. Yeah. And then you draw the arrow on each end, which indicates eternality, time, time, endless past, time, endless future. Mm-hmm. Now, you, now you say that at some point on that timeline, God created. But if you go back one tick, you're still on the timeline. That's all I'm saying. To say that God is outside of this thing called time, that's the illogic. That is but you can't you totally can't see like what I was just saying about that obviously like even myself I wasn't in the eighties but the eighties still existed of course so maybe for God it's like that as well but that doesn't put you outside of time but right. it puts us it puts him outside of the creation but, w- time. but you came into creation couldn't we just have come into creation and let's the just same? let's just say oh, we do. But if you look, at, if God were to look at it, He can He could pinpoint the time when creation started. Only He could. Nobody else can. So He can look at His calendar and be like, "Oh, this is the day that I created it." But so, five weeks before that, I was just chilling, you know, with my, by myself. Well, here's I, the- I really want to jump in. I really want to jump in here. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Um. You know, what we talk, I think you're hitting the nail on the, on the head a little bit there, Matthew, and that is we got to think about what we're talking about when we say the word time. We're, right. we're really talking about the measurement of the flow of events. Time is not a thing. Correct. So I, I'm just reading some articles online right now while you're talking, but, you know, we've never really defined time in physics. They say it's like a dimension, but it really isn't. It's only a dimension in mathematical models. So really, I've heard other scientists say, you know, the reality is time is only our measurement of movement in the universe. And so, you know, the way I think of that, when I relate that to what I know about God, is that time must be the movement of God throughout history. It's event after event. He moves us. He moves all of creation. So for us to say that time is a construct that he has to either work within or without, is kind of to me backwards it's more about god is acting and that's what creates time and and so it's just kind of like maybe if we flip it on its head we don't have to even have the argument anymore well do you think that god uh do you think i mean i guess so when god created that's when time started i guess so when god moves that's when time starts is that what you're trying to say I'm trying to say that time is not a thing in and of itself, other than the fact that God is acting. So when God didn't act, was time still there? He was God and he was doing something. Right. He had sequence. He had thoughts. Now, question. Do you believe that the future is not existent? Non-existent? Like the future has not happened yet because we're all like me, you, God, we're all here right now at well let me let me ask you a question if you were god and everything that existed existed because of you and you had put motion into everything do you think you would know the end from the beginning um yeah yeah so it, it at least exists in him knowing exactly how everything will play out and that's where i disagree yeah. I'm not saying that it is some kind of quantum thing where all realities and times exist in the same moment. I think that's bull. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is, because like Matthew's position, which I, I you know, understand because we've been talking about this for like over a year. But so for him, he agrees with everything you just said. But when you talk about the future, because like, like what we, you were saying, the, fu- the time is not something, it's not a thing. So the future is not real it hasn't happened yet so it's it's nothing you can't go into the future because it doesn't exist Mm. so god doesn't know the future because he's not there god is right now i think god knows more now 
than he ever knew ever. And tomorrow he'll know even more tomorrow than he does now. I believe that he can 100% know every single thing that will happen from here on out, but he can still not control it. He can allow it to play out. How? Yeah, why you not? Because he's got. Why not let it play out? Exactly. You get to choose. Like, it's a paradox to us, but he's God. I mean, we're human. Well, what if the Bible, like, see, now where does it say in the Bible that God knows everything that's going to happen? That's another verse. It says a few different places he has foreknowledge and a few other places that he has predestined or foreordained things. Okay. Yeah, before, foreordained is not foreknowledge, though. Exactly. So Thank you, Lori. Thank places. you. This, the different, there's different words in different places. So this is why I call myself a partial open theist, because what I say is that God definitely predestined a lot of different things to happen, mainly in the Old Covenant. Once the New Covenant takes place, the Bible's written, um, the, the New Cup, the Gospel is set forth. There's no reason for God to appoint apostles and prophets, things like that. There's no reason for God to, you know, direct a nation to do certain X, Y, and Z so that it could be written down. I'll take in that. You know, so there's, but what, what we do see in the Old Covenant is a lot of prophecy. Now, think about prophecy for a minute. The definition of prophecy is when God says something is going to happen. And then it happens. However, there's lots of prophecy that God made, and then God decided to change his mind before the prophecy happened. So God can predestine something and then change his mind and make it not happen. Or he can say, no, I'm not changing my mind like the cross and make it happen. But none of this proves that God knows what free will beings are going to do, because the definition of a free will is where you create your own future by deciding what you're going to do moment by moment. No right, one can but know. Why that. do you equate free will choosing mm -hmm. and God knowing what you're going to choose with him forcing you to choose it? Why do you equate the two things? Because to me, they're I'm, totally different. No, I'm not equating. I'm, I'm saying that because God decided to give you a free will, that means he also decided not to know a hundred percent what you will do now does he does god know what you're going to have for bre breakfast tomorrow more than anybody else why because he knows you better than anyone better than yourself but does he know definitively what you're going to have for breakfast tomorrow i say no does he need to know absolutely not if he needed to know he would predestine what you're going to have for breakfast and then he would know it. see what i'm saying so what we do is we, I think we tend to conflate the idea that, you know, God um, give he predestines some things with, he lets other things happen due to free will. And we, and we can't mix those two things up. Both take place in the Bible. He lets some things happen by free will. And then sometimes he intervenes and says, no, I'm going to pick 12 apostles. Aren't you the 12 whom I have chosen? And yet one of you is a devil. You know, but that doesn't mean he picked everybody. You know, that doesn't mean everything we read in the Gospels was foreordained. It means 12 apostles were foreordained. And that's what he's saying in, in Ephesians chapter 1. You know, you see the difference in verse 12 to 13. Um, and that's, that's all I'm saying is that... Um, the Bible reads as though God operates in time. He answers prayer. He deals with man in time and he does predestine some things. And then other things are um, subject to man's free will. And if God allows free will, then he cannot know what you're going to do. Otherwise it's not free anymore. If you can choose to do anything other than what you did, then it has to be written somewhere. It has to be pre-scripted, pre-written in God's mind, or it has to literally exist where God can look at it and say, I know what you're going to do now because I can see it. So unless he has this weird ability to know what free will beings are going to do, what's the point of having free will then? That's, that's what I'm saying. If that makes any sense.
I think what sways me the most is God changing his mind. And I know everybody looks at it, it's like he's just being facetious. But right. maybe he really actually means what he says. He did, did actually change his mind. Yeah, I just have a problem when it gets to Abraham, when he talks with Moses, that he was just going to kill the whole nation. And then Moses had to intercede. To me, I'm like, I don't see that actually being like literal, like 100%, like that's what was happening. Like God literally forgot his covenant. He had to remember it and he needed Moses to remind him to not what? to kill them all. I don't but think when it you read that it, God forgot. I mean, when he puts the bow in the sky so that he remembers. No, no, no that's, that's actually a different one. What I'm talking about is the yeah. golden calf when right. Moses has to literally say to God, like, because so God says, I'm going to kill everybody. Moses knows the Bible says, well, you can't because you have to remember your promise that you made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, what was the promise? That his seed would be a descendant, you know, that would be the fullness of the nations. But if you just leave Moses, now you're getting rid of the tribe of Judah. You're getting rid of the tribe of Ephraim, which were prophesied already beforehand in Genesis chapter 48, chapter 49 that this was going to, they were going to be the fullness of the nations, that this is how the nations are going to come in and all these things through Abraham. So if God did do what he said, then he, but everything that he just said before in the book of Genesis would just be not, wrong. Right, would be negated. Right, but yeah. what you're saying there is that once God says something, he's not allowed to change his mind. He's locked he, into his own decree. Yeah, but that's that would Calvinist. mean like you, you can't, rely on his promises because you never know he could just be like you know what i'm done saving people that's right you you can't rely I on don't. You yeah can't i mean of course people. and if you if you go your route and stay consistent then you know then there you go but so you're consistent on that i i would want to argue with the that you're a partial open theist now because the old testament's done away with so i, I mean i would think that wouldn't it be better to say that you're an open theist now because no, no, in Bible saying, time, that it was partial open, but now since the prophecies have been fulfilled, Old Covenant Israel is done away with, wouldn't it be right. open theism now? Right, I see your like point. 2000. No, I would say the future is open now, but I call myself a partial open theist because when I look at the entire Bible. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So when, when you look at the Old Covenant, when you're reading these manuscripts that are over 2,000 years old, that's partial theist, partial, partial open, open theism. theism right. But when you close the Bible and live your life, you're open theist, correct? Right now, but I, yeah. but I can't definitively speak on what God's doing now. He might be planning on things that we don't know about. It's not written. So I still would call myself a partial open theist because I see God, like if God wants to, if God wants me to do something for his kingdom, and and just and he's going to intervene into my free will then that makes that's that's the definition of partial open theism most of my life i'm able to choose but if god decides no i want you to do this now and and you can't do otherwise well then he intervenes and i think that's what he did in the old uh, that's what we read about yeah so yes yeah, so i see your point definitely with partial open theism in the Bible when you read it, but I just think, it, you know, like when you speak, I guess it sounds like open theism today. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I really, I really do think that, you know, the, the, the gospel had to be set up in order to do that. God did have to create the line of Judah, have the Messiah come, you know, the 12 apostles, the, the betrayer, Mm -hmm. All these things really had to line up the way God wanted them to. And I think he really intervened. I mean, you don't believe in free will, but if you did, like the free will, like David, Alan, myself, Albert, Lori, we believe free will. So therefore, when we look at the things that we know God wanted to happen and made happen as free will believers, we have to say, well, God intervened in free will god overrode some people's free will for a time in order to 
make and that's the definition well, of he prophecy. didn't even he didn't even have to override anything he could have just gone along with whatever dude man was doing and it just so happened to coincide mm, i don't think that i think god manipulated and directed free will in order yeah, to make uh, yeah I, I agree he could have totally done that but i i was just adding another right element. right but I think the mistake that the Calvinist makes is that they see when God did that and then they say, well, that's how God operates all the time and everything. We're Maybe. just playing Calvin. out, you know, we're just pawns in a, in a, in a chess game. We're, we're playing out a script, you know. I, I definitely don't see that in the Bible. Otherwise, the whole thing we can't take literally. I mean, but there's obviously parts that we take literally and parts that we don't take literally of course mm -hmm. so i mean you can't just say like oh well the calvinists don't do that so uh, i mean you know they don't take these literally i mean we all do that you know but in regards like, you know, to the bible says that god has wings and he, you know he's going to carry them under his wings well, yeah, no, obviously I, of course of course you know no, so know. there's definitely things so i mean i don't know that's just how i see it i just can't get around the uh, Exodus chapter 32, 33, that whole scenario. I think that one, in my, in my view, in my mind, uh, you haven't answered it like, you know, good enough to me to be like, wow, that actually is a good answer. Because there's yeah. just so much in the book. Like if Abraham is like the pinnacle, like he's just like spoken about in the old covenant and in the new covenant so much that this is the covenant that was, uh, you always even mention it, that he confirmed a covenant. Like, it is so pinnacle in the Bible, this Abrahamic covenant, that God was just at one point, like, if he knew that, if he knew he was going to have Paul the Apostle write these things to the Galatians, that you're going to be children of Abraham, like, all this stuff about Abraham, and he knew that before Abraham was even a twinkle in his father's eye, but then he told Moses, I'm going to just kill all his, his children. Makes no but, sense. Yeah, well, the New that, Testament wouldn't have been written that way if exactly. If it so, so no, but that's the thing. No, but what I'm saying. No, but what I'm saying is, is if God had already predestined Paul to write these things the way that He was going to write it, if Maybe that's predestined, well, I mean, I thought He was the elect. Well, Paul he was, was he, he was Ephesians chapter one. The yeah, but he would have wrote that, wrote it differently. He could have wrote it differently. But but still is, of course, of course. But that, that, what I'm trying to say is if God knew what he was going to write at Genesis chapter one, mm -hmm. if that's like what he knew and that was what's going to happen, just like the cross, because I would say the cross, the whole gospel, everything that's the component that makes it the gospel, right. all of it's predestined. So I can't pick and choose and be like, okay, well, maybe he would have written it differently. Well, well, no, because God would have made it differently from the beginning. He wouldn't have chose Abraham. He would have said, you know what, Abraham, I'm going to raise you up so I can kill your entire family and just leave just one guy named Moses and start with him. And then Paul would have been writing in Galatians, you know, we're children of Moses, you know, things like that. Right. But again, I just don't see that. I think the Abrahamic thing for me is, uh, I guess, something like just... I just don't but, see it. But, but Zach, look how the Bible reads. I mean, even the characters in the Bible, as we read, they act like the future is open. Like, here's an example. So God, God, wants to, uh, God wants the exodus to happen. He tells Moses to go to Pharaoh and let, you know, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And, uh, and, and, and so, so go do this and, and he'll listen to you. And, mm -hmm. and what does Moses say? The, the, the great open theist that Moses is, he says, well, what if he doesn't? Think about yeah. that. What if yeah, he doesn't? Of course. What, why didn't God turn around and say, Moses, it's predestined, dude. Like, yeah, it's what do you, faith. What do, you, what do you mean? Even the, the children, look, look at the children of Israel. They didn't have faith. <laughs> That's what the whole thing, the whole point is. They didn't have 100% perfect faith in God. Yeah, but that's now listen to the way God talks. It's like, we'll perform this, you know, put your hand in, take it out, put it in again. It'll it'll be it'll be Yeah, he, he's speaking to a finite creature. You're All talking right, about but, the infinite powerful he, God talking is he lying? to a little ant. No, it's the same way I talk to my child. 
like come on you talk about children having children and things like that i mean that's literally the same example that i would give for all those things you don't right. tell your son you know but when I don't know, says, hardcore details about stuff you just say here's your you know your bacon and eggs it. if he doesn't believe this miracle perform another one perhaps he'll, he'll believe that one so god yeah. was just like playing along with him like yeah he's talking to his child I don't know. I just can't read the Bible that way. I, I want yeah, we, we, that's the same thing. We both, it, and I've said this so many times before, it's really Genesis chapter one. It's how you interpret that is how you're going to interpret everything else. So sure, I you, believe that time, like the, the time that we are in was something that had started at a particular point, the calendar, January one, January 1st, whatever, boom, yeah. is when God said, let there be light. And then now from that moment on, every human is dealing with this calendar where in my mind that there was a, there was a day before God said, let there be light. I think David wanted to say something as well. No, I'm good. Oh no, never mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I never thought really of that until Alan said something like that. It made... In my mind, it makes sense. Oh, well, maybe maybe it was Alan. Maybe I thought it was David. But yeah, was somebody it. started to say something. My uh, bad. Was it you, Alan? No. Well, think about a clock for a moment. Like people uh, uh, oftentimes equate a clock with time. Now, a, a clock is 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 just something that is going to. Um, you know, fraction the day. So the, if the clock stops, you know, like some Christians talk about the sun and the moon, like time must have began because that's when God created the time. But you had days before the sun. So that's, that's not the case. So you know there was time at the very least a few days before the sun and moon and stars were created. So Sun, moon, and stars doesn't begin time, you know, any more than, you know, if, if, you got, if you eliminated every clock on the face of the earth, time would not stop. So all, all the sun and the moon did was depict, you know, night and day and give us a calendar. But a calendar is not time either. You know, time is like, like, uh, like David said before, I agree 100%. Time is definitely not a thing, and it, and it cannot be created. It's like an aspect of existence. If you are conscious, then you're, quote, in time, even though I hate using it that way, but that's the way that we have to use the word. It's a very tricky word. You can't talk about it without using it the wrong way. Like, uh, you know, if are we in time? What do you mean in time? No. You, you go in a car, you know, you go in a house, but to go in time, it almost makes no sense if you think about it for a minute. So to say, you know, God is outside of time, to me, that doesn't make any sense. And, and I hear it all the time. Like, God is outside of time. He's outside. It's like, rah, rah, God's outside of time. Like that's all Christians ever say. And I'm like, <laughs> it's just where? Like where do you read that, please? That's yeah. all I'm asking. Oh, that's all I ever ask is just show me the verse. I mean, it, it is pretty interesting that even so now there's three calendars. If you think about it, you have the time before Genesis 1 verse 1. You have the calendar of when creation started. And then you have, you know, the sun, moon, and stars being another time calendar. Well, I don't know if it's three different calendars. I mean, it's all the same time. It's all the same. Yeah, it's all the same time, but different starting points. Show a verse. That's really like all he was asking was to show the verse of the thing that he was asking for. Yeah. So Genesis zero. So Genesis chapter zero, Genesis one one, and then Genesis one fourteen. So like, where was God the the millisecond or the moment right. before he created? Like he was obviously somewhere. 
if, if the Bible says he created heaven and earth, was he in heaven when he created? Yeah, but the was question heaven is, already there. The question is not where was he. The question is when. Yeah, when. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't matter. It, but we, you would still say that God was there before he created Genesis 1 1, the heavens and the earth, correct? Right, but the minute you say before, that's a time word. That means there's time before the creation. Yeah. There's God's time where he lives. <laughs> well, you can call it God's time, but God is up in the Bible. We read God dealing with man. That's God's time too. I know, but you wouldn't see like that. Obviously the Bible's written through a man's perspective, talking to a, to God. So it's kind of obviously God going to be coming down to him. Well, it's not I, man going up yeah. to God. I mean, I know so that obviously God's going to come down here and come into the creation, talk to Moses, you know, talk to Isaiah, come in the flesh as Jesus Christ and different things like that. While, you know, well, way always, before that, he's above so the heavens. All these things existed already. It's just, there's a we have a perception of god of, yeah man's of eyes belief. versus god's eyes right so god's just making us believe that he's operating in time but he's really not well i mean zach what do you how would you explain god quote god's time like is he can he rewind history and fast forward or jump around and I mean, I would say that God. I, I would say God wouldn't rewind because everything's happening according to His plan, the way that He created it. Do you see Him as on a different timeline? Offense, but I, I see Him. A cop um, out. Say that again. I'm just saying it just kind of seems like a cop out what you just said. But go ahead. Okay, that's cool. Um, so, um, yeah, I just want to hear His view. On it. Yeah, my, my view is pretty much just like the main Calvinistic perspective in the sense that, you know, before the world began, God predestined events in, this, in, in life. I believe pretty much the main thing, especially when I talk about Calvinism, is its salvation, soteriology. How does one get saved? How does one come to God? And those are the big things. Um, I know you can get into the nitty and gritty and be like, oh, well, what color shirt am I going to wear tomorrow? Um, that I don't really like to debate, but the, how does one come to God? Like the salvation point, you know, I take Ephesians chapter one as written through the eyes of God. You know, you can say, you know, it's just the apostles. Let's just say that's true. It's just the 12 apostles, like the, the chosen ones, like Matthew would say, well, they were chosen before the foundation of the world according to ephesians 1 they were saved justified sanctified genesis chapter 1 way before they were ever even born but then you get to ephesians chapter 2 and the same writer says that we were dead in our trespasses and our, in our sins so he's talking about that even though that from the foundation of the world i'm saved justified you know in christ but at, at some point when I was a human being in, you know, whatever date that was, 30 AD, 50 AD, whenever Paul became a believer, he was dead. But, but something happened in his life where he became a believer. And this was obviously after, you know, Jesus Christ died and raised, you know, that he became alive. So right there shows you, God's perspective that before you were ever even born, you're saved. And then chapter two, Ephesians chapter two, that at some point in your life, your eyes were opened and you were saved in that moment. Could it be that, all right, so let's talk, let's go back to the apostles for a minute. So 12 apostles were definitely predestined, but it's in my mind, it's not as though the actual 12 apostles were chosen from before the foundation. I don't believe that's what it's saying. Because so what's Ephesians 1 said? Don't you uh, correlate that? Let me finish the point. Because they didn't exist. What I believe actually took place is this. God knew that he was going to set up a nation, that the Messiah was going to come to that nation, that, that the nation was going to have 12 tribes, and that representative of 12 tribes were going to be 12 apostles to bring, to bring the 12 tribes into the new covenant through Christ. 
But when Christ came, Christ looked around and he chose 12. It's not that these 12 existed before, the, before, uh, before they were born. No, no, no. Christ looked around and said, you, you, and you. And what did they all do? Not one of them said no. They, Christ said, follow me. And they dropped what they were doing and followed him because they had no choice. Their wills were at that moment overridden. Paul was one born out of due season. He's the, he is, I believe, the true 12th. Uh, he's the replacement of Judas, in my mind. And, but, but it's not like Paul himself was God. Jesus uh, could have chosen any other Pharisee. I think he chose a Pharisee who knew the law on purpose so that that Pharisee who knew the law could actually go back into the old covenant and, and reinterpret the way Christ wanted him to. Amen. So he, he didn't have to pick Paul. He could have picked any Pharisee that knew the law backwards. But and now I'm really confused. So, I mean, every time you've interpreted Ephesians, you say the us is referring to the apostles. So when you look at verse four, mm -hmm. Ephesians one, four says, even as he chose us, the apostles, would you, that's Paul, of course, in him before the foundation of the world that we, the apostles, mm -hmm. should be holy and blameless before him, Jesus Christ, in love. So would you say that this was God's, like, I'm going to choose 12, but I don't know who they are at that time. But, but when, I, when, when the perfect time comes, you know, Galatians chapter 4, he came in at the fullness of time. At that moment, God just said, okay, I'm going to choose 12. You, 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 you. But I yeah, didn't know you could, before. Okay. It, in my mind, gotcha. it could be, could be actually either way. God could have said, like, he could have created the personality in his mind, but the person wasn't created yet. So, yeah, I don't say the person was created either. Yeah, so if the person wasn't created yet, see, God gave, you know, we're coming at it from two totally different perspectives. And that's the, yeah. that's the reason why it's hard to argue with each other, because, you know, I'm saying that, that, um, that God gave man the free will to procreate. So it's the will of man, like, like the beginning of the Gospel of John says, you, and he describes how the new birth is. And he, he says, you know, this is not the kind of birth. You know, this is born of God. It's not the kind that's the will of man, the physical birth, because that's what procreation is. It's God giving you the ability to say, I'm going to be with my wife and have a baby now. To me, that's, that's free will. Or you, so, could drop, or you could be like somebody else in the Bible, drop your sperm on the ground and God could get mad at you. You know, that's free will. You know what I mean? So, so really the, the, the discussion we're really having, if we boil it down, is free will versus a Calvinist view of uh, sovereignty and predestination? No, it's really, does God know the future? That's really where it comes down to. Because, I mean, we just mentioned, someone mentioned, I think it was you, that the, the uh, Paul's conversion. So I, I went to that passage I was reading, and essentially in Acts 26, Paul is talking to Agrippa about it. That's where the story comes from, and he's telling him what happened. And he said, you know, they were on the road, the light appeared to me, and Jesus said, it is I who thou persecutest, rise and stand on your feet. I'm here to deliver you from the people and the Gentiles unto whom I'm now going to send you. And he says in verse 19, this is Paul to Agrippa saying, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. They're implying that he could have been disobedient to the heavenly vision. So, so I think before the assertion was kind of made that he was predestined. And so there was no chance he was not going to pick to obey God in this situation, but he kind of infers that he chose. So how God. do you interpret that with Ephesians chapter one? I don't know. Let's go there. Ephesians one, uh, verse five, I think, having predestinated us into adoption. Of it would be children. before that. It would be starting like verse like, uh, let me see. Verse four is where he says the foundation of the world. You can start in verse three. 
Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated, predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So I know the, you know, the Calvinistic view is that the word predestinated means that it was so foredetermined that it could, nothing about that situation could have ever changed, right? Never could have happened other than how it happened. Correct. Right. Because that's what it says right here, it before the foundation of the world. So the way that, like I interpret, I, I interpret this as, you know, everybody that's going to be saved, obviously, is in this category. Matthew says that it's only referring to the 12. And I'll, I'll even, you know, adopt that interpretation just to go with it to show that these people, these 12 apostles that God chosen, they were just no random choice like oh you know i'm gonna just pick a hat oh that that guy is walking towards me so pick you yeah it was yeah. it was predestined it was chosen before the foundation of the world and this is why god came <coughs> at the fullness of time because this is the pinnacle of time that everything is coming to fruition everything is at the perfect time this is the same time where let's just say these 12 are, are picked boom everything coincides perfectly and so if you were to look through God's eyes, God's eyes are saying that I've chosen these 12 before the foundation of the world to save them, to justify them, to, to bless them with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Uh, to, he predestined them for adoptions. So that's God's eyes. Right. But when Paul starts speaking again in chapter two, he says, and you were dead in our trespasses and sin in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work with the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive with Christ, by grace, you have been saved. So, and how I'm looking at that is, well, chapter one just said that these apostles were chosen before the foundation of the world to be blessed with every spiritual blessing, to be adopted as sons. That was before they were ever even born. Right. At Genesis chapter one. But then you get to Ephesians chapter two. And he's talking in time, at one, in his life, within his life, that at one point he was this dead sinner, but then at one point God came into his right. life and now he's alive. Right. Exactly. I agree with that. And I agree with that. But I, I mean, I, I'm not in accordance, I don't think, with that that's just the 12. Um, but I mean, Same. I agree with you to a point, but, but I can't, I don't bring Calvin to this. And I do I've never read anything about things. Calvin either. Okay, well, I, I, just so you know, I don't approach anything from the perspective of Calvin because I feel like it is a box in which the Bible does not operate. There are too many places that say, you've got to choose. You've got to do this. You have to be righteous. You have to be set apart. It takes daily turning away from self, and that's something you do. It's not. Yeah, I, I, I and agree. So, and the church fathers, the early church fathers, also would agree that man had to volitionally choose to do the righteous in, a, in a opposition to sin, because if not, if Calvin was 100% right, and everyone was, had, God has his finger on every chosen person's head, and they can only do what he allows them to by moving with his finger, then that takes away their responsibility for their sin. Well, I and don't so think the Calvin early church fathers would that. argue against that, and which I also do. So I think that the, the reality is for me that this is, a, like I used the word before, it's a paradox to me because he does know and he did choose, but we all have free will and have the responsibility to make the right choices. Yeah. And I can't explain that to you in human terms, but I can tell you that, and I think you know that the Bible says both things in many places. Right. Yeah. Now, now, what's interesting is where I would agree. Um, 
uh, not agree, but the uh, the stance of saying that you would accept some of these things that I was saying, but then also see the free will aspect of it. So it's kind of like uh, taking both sides of it and trying to make it work, whatever. Now, do you believe, because um, I guess the biggest thing is, is I believe that somebody that is, you know, I guess like Arminian or in that type of camp that I would, you know, just yeah. like, you know, Calvin and whatever, um, is it's in my mind, it's inconsistent to say God like knows the future and knows what's going to happen, but you still have free will because it's not really free will if he knows what's going to happen. And that's like another topic that, you know, what no, that, on, the, that, on the panel no, we were talking about. not a logically correct statement. If, if I, <laughs> I agree with Zach. I, I, I mean, right there. Yeah, yeah I, so, I know you do, but I don't. Um, oh. To know the end is not the same thing as to produce the end. Do you know what I'm saying? Understood. It, it's 100% different. It is. But, can, but I mean, can you God do does. And know it at the same time. That's why he's God. I mean, we can't do that because we're humans, but he can do that because he's God. I know, but, I mean, know it's exactly. It's really not an happens. answer, though. You he can deduce the, 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 the formula at once. Because can you not deduce a formula? Like it's you like, know, like yeah, it's like if I say God can stop being God, and you say no, He can't. And I said yes, He can. He's God. It's not an answer. There has to be an, a logical answer of how can even God give you free will, where you can literally choose one way or the other, and yet He's going to know. And then you have to prove to me in the Bible that that's the case, which which I don't believe you can do. If you chose not to obey him, not to follow him, then you were never chosen from the beginning. Well, let's say I'm, be I'm a believer and I came to believe volitionally, like you said, but I'm going to choose to do this or that, to move here, to move there, just some, you know, whatever, decisions in life. Does God know every decision that I'm going to make? Does God know the day that I'm going to die? Because if he didn't predestine it, how does he know it? And does the Bible say that he knows it? Are you saying his mind works the same way ours does? No. Well, then you can't explain it, right? No, but I, if, if I'll you're explain saying, it. You're saying the God's acting and his will and his mind and the way he works has to be 100% logical to you. No, that doesn't I'm, make any sense. No, no. I'm saying that after reading the Bible for a long time, I don't find in it any scriptures that prove to me that God knows what free will creatures are going to do. He does know the things that he predestines. But, he, but that's the very, very, very definition of prophecy. See, like if you're a Calvinist, to, to me, prophecy is redundant. Everything is prophecy if you're a Calvinist. If you're a free will guy or gal, then you have to you have to realize that the prophetic is when God says this is going to happen regardless of free will. Like free will is the paradigm, but I'm going to make this thing happen. So that's prophecy unless I change my mind before it takes place. And that's, all I'm saying is that's the way the Bible reads. That's how it reads. That's how God portrays himself to us. He never portrays himself as, I know what you're going to do in the future. He just doesn't. We've been taught that. And well, it doesn't don't... matter if he does either. What's that? It doesn't matter if he does, if he knows what I'm gonna eat for breakfast in the morning or not. Well, he can. I'm just saying the Bible doesn't say that he does. Right. But I'm saying either way, it has no bearing on this discussion, really. Well, it does, because in, within the body of Christ, if things happen, um, like let's say something, something very terrible happens to, to a new Christian. Hang on. Is somebody typing? Sorry. And, and, then, and then something really, really happens to this Christian that they think God has set them up for. And then all of a sudden it, it goes terribly wrong. 
well, well, God knew this was going to happen? Like the atheists, there's a lot of atheists in the world who are atheists simply because they say, because they hear from us, well, God knows the future. And then in their mind, they're thinking, well, wait a minute, God knew all of these rapes and child molestations and everything, and he created the world anyway? Like, what the heck kind of God is that? I want no part of him. So our wrong theology in a free will paradigm can literally stop somebody from coming to God. If they knew, no, God doesn't know because you have a free will, but God is good. To me, it does make a difference. I see a lot of negativity and people, uh, you know, not wanting to come to God because of this free will thing and God, or, or even, even worse, tell the atheist that God predestined all of these rapes and see if they want to come to God. No, I would never tell them that. I don't I'm know. Just, I don't you know, know I'm just saying to, it's one thing to say God knows all this bad stuff that's going to happen, but you know, you should love him anyway. And, it, and, and then it's even worse to tell them, well, God predestined it. To me, it, it makes a huge difference. The, 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 the God who sets up free will and gives man responsibility and sits back and says, these are my ways. Now you have a choice whether to do them or not. That's the God you can preach to the unbeliever to and say, well, you have a choice. But you act like God created man to be a part of this world. Mm -hmm. He did not. At least I don't believe so. Well, that would go into another topic, <laughs> which we could. No, go it into. would, but that's why that's why I can I can discuss that with people because the way He created us was different than we are now, and because of our sin, we're now a part of this, and we have to play through this. Right. And so the rapes, the murders, all that's because of this mm -hmm. this place we're in. But because so, you're a free will guy, then you believe that God really kind of allowed this for a purpose, free will. And we had free will before we fell. That's true. Right. Just like the angels. Which I agree with. See, I think free will is, is the purpose. It's God wants children that, you know, are going to volitionally. What, what good is a relationship if you force some, you know, you don't go pick a wife by putting a, a love me drug in, in their drink. You know, you want them to love you uh, on their own. And I think that's, how, that's why God gave us a free will. But, but in order to have free will, you got to have the antithesis to good. And, there, and that's why all the evil takes place. God just can't keep, you know, I can tell this to the atheist. I could say, well, look, if you want everything to be good, if, you're, if you don't like God because bad things are happening and you want everything to be good, well, then you want God to just create everybody without a free will. And, and I don't think you want that. So in, in order to have free will, you got to have bad and, and, and suffer the consequences temporarily, at least. You know, I think, I think free will is God's main purpose in what I call program earth. But at the same time, he did need to uh, predestined things and the way uh, I didn't the way that I read Ephesians and Zach knows exactly how I read it but if you read all the way through there's a whole bunch of personal pronouns there there's the us's and the we's all throughout verses like three uh, through through 12 but if you know Paul you know that he always writes to the to the church referring to him and the apostles as us and we. It's like in 1 Corinthians when he says, you know, you are full, you are rich, you reigned as kings without us. You know, he's talking about you, church, versus us, the apostles. You know, for I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. That's how he's writing Ephesians, because Ephesians, the purpose of it is to try to show the Ephesian church that they are on par now and the middle wall of partition has been torn down and they were 
they were far but have now been brought near so what does he do he starts off by saying we apostles were chosen before the foundation we were given the knowledge we were shown things and now i'm giving it to you you know and that's why you see that uh like he goes into verse 12 and he says uh or 11 in whom also we have obtained an inheritance of course he's the church has obtained an inheritance but he doesn't get there yet he's saying we have been predestinated according to a purpose and then he says in order that we and then he defines it in verse 12 should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in christ who's the we that first trusted in christ that's the 12. And then he says, in whom you, now he switches in verse 13 to you, you also trusted when? After you heard the word of truth. So basically he's saying, we were predestined before the foundation. You believed after you heard our gospel. So that's, you know, if you, it's a, it's a big run on sentence in the Greek from verses three to 12. So if you don't, if you don't read it like that, you're going to keep thinking that Paul is saying we, us, as if he's just talking to the church. And he is talking to the church, but he's referring to him, to the apostles as us and we. And then when he gets to verse 13 and he says, in whom you trusted after you believe. And then he, now he rolls everything up. And from that point on, he starts talking about us as a whole. One, you know, one in Christ, which is the purpose of Ephesians. It's to show the, the, the Gentile Ephesians that now they have been, you know, far, but have been brought near. So, and this is, this is the theme that I think Paul does in all of his epistles. He talks about us and we, including himself as one born out of due season as an apostle, writing to the church, the you. You know, you see that in Corinthians a lot too. So I don't think that, um, that this is saying that the whole church was predestined like Calvinists would say, but the, but the non-Calvinist has a very tough time with Ephesians 1, 3 through 12. And they have to come up with all kinds of ways to, to counter the Calvinist belief. And they have to say, well, it's, it's we were predestined corporately. Everyone who believes was corporately predestined not to be saved, but to have such and such in salvation, which to me makes no sense at all. It's like when Paul talks about, you know, um, we were we were slaughtered, you know, or we, were, you know, what does he say? We, we were counted as sheep for the slaughter. Most Christians think he's talking about the church, that we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. No, he was talking about the apostles. Because in 1 Corinthians 4, he tells them, you guys are doing fine. But us apostles, we, we're like being killed all day long for your sake. You know, we are fools for Christ's sake. You are wise in Christ. We are weak. You are strong. You are dis distinguished. We are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless, and we labor. All the we's are referring to the apostles. Working with our hands, being revived, we bless, being persecuted, we endure, being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world. But, but he says, but as my beloved children, I warn you, you know, that's what he does in all of his books, including Ephesians. There's a we and there's a you. We lost Zach.
What do you think, Lori? Well, I think that it, um, because I, I, I must have watched a freaking hundred videos on it. You know, reading the word over and over, Ephesians and the you and the we, and it's, it's, it's kind of the only thing that came to make sense to me because I don't believe uh, Calvinism. Um, I believe that we have a free will. Amen. And uh, <clears throat> so this, this, I really wrestled with God about this one. And I've sat on a fence with it for a long time and, and we haven't discussed it really in a long time. But uh, yeah, it, it actually really changes your relationship with the Lord. And then you find out where your trust lies, that he can, uh, if he doesn't know the future, and we are somehow responsible for our future to a degree, right? I, I think it just changes everything. Well, it makes God much more relational. See, the, Absolutely, the, without a doubt. I, I truly believe that, um, you know, and us Christians hate to admit this, but there's a lot of Gnosticism that crept into the early church, and this is part of it. To say that God is, in, is outside of time is actually platonic. That's what Plato taught. And, that's, and now we say it in the church, like it's part of what the Bible teaches. And it's not. The Bible just doesn't teach that anywhere. It portrays God from <clears throat> beginning to end as relational and, and dealing with us in real time. You have to go outside of what's written to say that God is outside of time. And what you're doing is you're mingling Christianity with paganism. You're making God this, this, you know, like in, in paganism, this God is this, um, or in Gnosticism, God is this standoffish. He's, he's, he's out there, you know, he's not really dealing with us, but in Christianity, we know he deals with us. So when you take the two concepts, you mingle them together, you get modern Christianity. God deals with us in real time, but, He's outside of time. Like, to me, that's what makes no sense. I think it's almost because people, you know, have this vision of God uh, sitting on his throne, way high up sort of thing, and, and he's distant. He's just overlooking everything. And um, right. I, think, I think that happens with a lot of Christians and that he's not actually inside time with us. You know, and as we talk to him and we have a relationship with him and we pray and um, I mean, God says the fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Well, if it's, if he knows the future and he knows the past, if he knows the future, I just don't understand. I, I, to me, it's more glorifying to God that he can work anything out. Does that make sense? No, it really, it really does. You know, I, I think that uh, anytime God asks questions or is doing anything like that, it's it's for our benefit. Um, he knows the answer. He's not uh, caught off guard by what my answer, but it's for our benefit because we are in this space we call time. But I completely disagree with you, Matthew, because as far as saying it's pagan to believe that God is outside of time, um, because it, that's the only logical conclusion you can come to if you believe the time we live in, that there was a beginning. Otherwise, um, you're saying the time that was before the beginning is the same time that we have now, but God's eternal, then therefore we would have never reached this point if it's all the same time. If it, uh, it just doesn't follow a logical conclusion. You have to see that God's eternal. He wasn't created. He didn't have a start. He always was. And if that's the case and he's living in the same time we are currently, we would never have gotten to this point because that's not how infinity works. I wouldn't describe it that way and say that God is living in the same time that we are because it doesn't even make sense. Well, what I mean, that's, that's what it's... That's, 
you know, all I'm saying is that time is not actually a thing to be created. To begin I'm, I'm saying time, I'm, I agree time was not created. Time was a result of the creation. In other words, you can't have creation oh, without that's time. That's almost the same thing as saying it was created. Well, I guess my question is, is, is God eternal? Yes. And but, but eternality is different from timelessness. So there was, was there a beginning in God? No. That's, that's the conundrum. That's illogical. It's, it's, it's really not a conundrum, though, because... How can God, being eternal, never having a beginning... It doesn't mean he's outside of time. It's two separate concepts. I guess I'm trying to describe it from a human perspective. From our perspective, he is outside of the time we live in, but also in it. But he now you're live. like Zach. You're having two different times. Like, that doesn't make any sense. No. No. It, see, I don't... God is way above our level, way above our understanding. Um, and and to, to bring in open theism, it's like you're pulling God down to try to make him like us so that we're relatable. <laughs> no, 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 no. Open theists don't try to pull God down. They just read the Bible and take it. Well, you, say, you say that God's a good guesser. I believe God knows all things. He does That's, know all things, but the future is not a thing, is my point. You're, you're saying God's a good guesser, is what I'm saying. If, if I say, I can say as an open theist, God knows all things. But the future, think about the word future. If I say to you, Alan, what is the future? Forget about God or anything like that. What's the future? You would say, well, it's, it's things that will take place after today. Or, you know, like you, it's even hard to describe what the future is. But we can agree that the future is not the future until the present passes. So the future is unfolding as we speak. From our perspective, I agree with David and that there's no, that to believe God knows everything, even the future does not take away free will. Just because he knows what you're going to do doesn't oh, I mean get it. I, you to do anything. I, for 20 years, I believed exactly the same way as, you, as both you guys. I believed that we have free will. I was never a Calvinist. I believed that we have free will. And I believed that God knows the future. And then, you know, five years ago, when I started really digging into the Bible and questioning every doctrine that I have, that's when I, that's when I realized, wait a minute, the Bible doesn't read that way. Why do I believe it? And it's not bringing God down. It's believing the words that God placed in that book for us to read. Because he's placing the words in the book for us in our time so that it's... it's. Uh, I know, but you're, you're going beyond what's written. You're no, going no. beyond what God gave you. No, and I'm you're saying, saying no. I know God just gave that Genesis, to me for my Genesis own. Genesis 1, 1 is written. In the beginning, God mm -hmm. right. created me. So... You, I'm not the one that has the problem with God being eternal. You do. I, I really, I, you haven't explained that yet. Because it says in the beginning, God created in the beginning of what, what's the context? What's in the, what does it mean by in the beginning, in the beginning of what? In the beginning of creation, what we live oh, in now. There you go. The physical creation, right? So in the beginning of creation of this world, God said, let there be light. No, I have no problem with that. That doesn't mean that I think God is not eternal. So I God know. can be God can be eternal, but that doesn't also mean he's outside of time. Do you understand that's a logical fallacy to believe that? No, it is not. I disagree with you that it's that it's uh, that it's a fallacy. Because God's eternal, mm -hmm. he's the one that created the time we live in. I know you don't see it that way. He created but but Alan, in. it doesn't say he created the time we live in. Your those are your words. See what, no, I'm, what I'm saying? Time began, and what we give, know, what we understand to be time. Can you give me a verse? From the very beginning, God created the male female. Uh, I'm saying from what from our perspective, time right. began. We don't have any history of before creation. From our perspective, it was just I'm, God. 
Before I'm going to keep I'm going to keep pressing for a verse that proves that God is outside of time. Just one. Well, there's a big Bible. There's got to be a verse. The, but that's not the point. You, you know, show me a verse that proves God is restricted to time. Oh, God is not restricted. He's omnipotent. You, you say he is. This no, is I, no, I never he said can't that. He can't be outside of time. He must be in time. Show God is that no, no, no. Him to Whoa, be you, oh, you, you can't put words in my mouth. I did not yes. say God is restricted. Well, that's that's what you're putting on me. It's kind of a, a, a illogical question because uh, I can ask the same thing of you. Show but me I'll a verse. But I'll give you an answer. It proves that he has to be in time. Always. He's never outside of time. The, the entire Bible reads that way. Right. It just but does. Just because it doesn't, it doesn't, kind of, doesn't say that, though. Sure it does. Look, it say if God, God is, time. in the fullness yeah. of time, God became a man, right? It's, God is patient, not willing that any should perish. He's patient, right? right? Jesus waits at the right hand of the Father. He waits Omission there. is not proof. There was, there's silence in heaven for a half an hour in the book of Revelation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I'm giving you verses that show God is in time. Right, but you're not showing me verses that prove he is only in time. Yeah, Alan, what, how would you describe being out of, outside of time? What, what yeah. attributes does that ascribe to God? Ex explain that to me. I, that's the thing. I can't understand it. But I have to, I mean, if I'm thinking before creation, what was there? And I believe God is eternal. I can't, my mind can't comprehend that. How was God always here? How was he always here? Well, see, Matthew, I mean, I can understand what he's saying in relationship to if you totally equate the running of time to the physical creation, then I see where he's coming from on that. I mean, it's just kind of a perspective difference, maybe a semantic difference. I don't know. Don't you think? It could be a yeah. bit of a semantic difference, but I don't think, you know, God is spirit and then he, he created physicality. But that doesn't mean just that in itself doesn't mean that something has to change in relation to time. If God, cho if God chooses to create physicality and the creation, the physical world, um, he can certainly do that in a point in time in God's life. And, if, and if, if God becomes a man, or at least whether you're Trinitarian or Unitarian or, you know, oneness, it doesn't make a difference. Something changed in the nature of God. He was manifest in the flesh in a particular point in time. This gives God a past, present, and future. Period. The incarnation itself proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that God operates, quote, in time. Because you cannot, God, even God cannot be in time and out of time and yet not be a man for eternity past but become a man at a certain point of time that's the thing that makes no sense and to say that god you know is eternal which which i believe but operates in time even before the creation and at a point a certain point in time created the physical universe i don't say created time because I don't think time is a thing to be created. That's not unbiblical and it's not illogical. Well, do you understand that the reason I say it's a logical fallacy is because if God is eternal mm -hmm. and he just doesn't have a beginning right. in that state, if you, if he doesn't change or create something in that state, he would never, if, and you say that, eternity past is the same it's just we've reached this time point where he created things mm -hmm. you can't say that because if it's eternity past you never reach this point that's how that's how infinity works you will never reach your destination there's no such thing as a destination within eternity if a timeline if, so you're saying if a if, if a timeline is eternal then you can't have a point in time that's what right. you're saying that makes no sense why right. can't you have a point in time? Let's, let's say go back. We, we believe, I mean, I believe the earth is 6,000 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's just agree that that's what it is. 
let's go back a million years on your timeline and it's just God. It, how far do you have to go back before you can't go back anymore? Forever. But Forever. You can't, you'll never reach, in other words, you'll never reach that point that you're there, that you're talking about because it, you can never have a, it's, that's how infinity works. It's, it's, it's very uh, difficult, but it causes a logical fallacy. If you believe God is eternal and in time only. Let's see, Alan, I think that the way we're thinking of it is that because God's, because God is time, so to speak, it doesn't matter. You can't say from our perspective, you wouldn't say God's in time or we're in time. We're just acting and we measure things that happen, events, on a continuous, consistent basis. And we call that time. But from our perspective, it's just God that is time. And the fact that he makes things play out this way that causes history. So, yes, we call that time. We have this word that's just about meaningless. It really is a description of our measurement of movement. Right. And so, so... I guess we understand your perspective, but we're, we're taking a different look at it and, and trying not to use time as a construct within or without which we place God. Instead, God is the flow of time. He, he makes it all happen. So without him, there would be no time, right? I mean, we could all agree on that. Right. And so, so saying what was before creation, it, it doesn't matter. It was God. And he was acting <clears throat> then maybe in a different way than he's acting now, but he was still acting. And so there was a flow of events. And so if we call that time, that was time too. So, so I don't think, I think we're, we really are in some way arguing semantics. It doesn't matter whether we say it your way or our way. We all agree he was in the past forever and he'll go on forever. <laughs> we all agree on that. It's just from my perspective or my worldview, uh, because I believe that before creation, God was, was, it was different. Okay. That something new started in the beginning and it's in that state that God can be both. That's why he knows, even he knows what time, how time's going to play out. He knows the future. Do you, do you think all, uh, time is going quote time, whatever that is, is going to stop at some point? No. No, he created, he, that he's, this is what he did for us, for his creation. I believe uh, that it's going to continue forever. Well, I mean, I understand your perspective. I do. You know, the whole construct of the universe, you know, was created. What, what was there before the universe? Nothing. <clears throat> It's it's very difficult to really wrap your head around, but that, but to believe that God doesn't know all things, I just I just can't accept that. I believe God is well, so I mean, bigger well, than what right. We and about. I'd love to come back to that and ask you, Matthew. You you made the statement earlier that you know you did all that study or whatever, and and through all that you came to realize that God didn't know what was going to happen in the future because if he did that would mean he was in some way culpable for all the horrible things that have happened up to that point right not so much culpable because if the, i do get the concept that you know uh, god can know the future without having predestined it so, okay. so well, i know that the, but you said I, the opposite of that earlier what i no, i'm just saying i understand that concept I don't think that concept don't agree is with possible. Me? Okay, okay. So then how do you explain prophecy? Because prophecy is when God says, I'm going to make something happen despite free will. Very simple. So he sets up a paradigm of free will, but then he some says... Some examples, Matthew. What's that? Can you give us some examples in the scripture? Sure. The biggest one is the cross. So... I'm, I'm, I'm giving people free will. Let's just say he gives Israel, the nation, free will. But yet, 
the reason he created the nation is so that they can, uh, you know, through the nation, the Messiah will come. So now God says, I want the Messiah to come through this nation. It's going, he's going to be born under the law, he's going to be born of a woman who I'm going to choose. You know, all of these things, all, we read so many events that are quite obviously scripted. And the things that take place are not coincidences. And I believe God really, really like set these things to be the way they are. So that when they got written down, it's very cohesive. So I think God was really intervening in free will quite a lot through the nation of Israel. But that's not to say that he's doing that as a, as a rule of thumb. I think he was doing that to create prophecy. So like I said before, prophecy would be redundant if God knew what was going, uh, knew everything that was going to take place. Well, then it's all prophecy. Everything, even, even the shirt you're going to wear tomorrow is really prophecy. You know, it's just not written down for you to read about it. But prophecy is when God says, okay, even though I've set up free will, this thing is going to happen. Of course, for the last 2,000 years, we don't have any of that. There is, there is no new prophecy. So that tells me that in the old covenant, God had lots of uh, reasons to say this is going to happen. That's going to happen. The other is going to happen. And sometimes he changed his mind, but a lot of times he didn't. And leading right up to the cross, leading right up to the, uh, you know, the destruction of Israel. After that, you know, we're in a time in the last 2,000 years where nobody can say for certain God predestined all of this because there's no scripture to read about it. So if, if, if you're just going to go by logic that, and, and you're going to know the Bible, but then realize that all prophecy basically ceased in 70 AD, then you have to come to the conclusion well, now that the gospel is out there and, and, the, and the truth of God is written down for us to read, there's really no reason for God to be manipulating free will. You know, what prophecy has to be fulfilled now? So I think I, I just feel like you're speculating at that point, though. You're I, kind of like I, I saying, definitely well, I think it's that way because there's nothing else I can point to. No, I, that is, a, uh, you know, I admit that that's a bit of speculation, but it's it's i think it's proper speculation because the bible only goes so far you know like and and we see the reason why those prophetic events happened to bring about the messiah and to set up the new covenant with the gospel now it's it's up to men's free will to believe that gospel or not and then you can go back and read the history of how the gospel came to be you know, so what is God prophesying for today? If he is, nobody's writing it down. He's not instructing anyone to write it down. We would reject it if somebody started writing things down and saying, this is God's prophecy. We'd call him a false prophet. So it's not really speculation. It's just sticking with the Bible, as far as I can tell. <clears throat> And I really don't see a reason why, you know, to me, God is a very, very big God. Now, if God, um, even though I'm an open theist, I do not pull God down. What I don't want to see is for people to attribute to God things that are not in his word and, and make God out to be something that he's not. If he portrays himself to me in the Bible as a relational God that operates with man in time, and here's your prayer, as you pray it, See, the Bible doesn't say that God knows what you're going to pray before you pray it. It says he knows what you need before you pray it. Now, that's a huge difference. But why do Christians have to read something like that and say, see, God knows what I was going to pray before I pray it. It doesn't say that. So why do you say it? You know, I'm just one who's, a, who's trying to, you know, read the Bible, take it at face value, 
know when something is supposed to be metaphorical, but know when something's supposed to be literal. And, you know, not attribute to God things that aren't written there just because, well, he's God. You know, can he, can he lift a rock that he, you know, is he, can, what, how does that saying go? Can he make a rock so big that he can't lift it? Yeah, that saying he... speaks to this issue. You know, can God, um, can God create free will beings and know what they're going to do? That's impossible. That's... Then your God's not big enough. <laughs> I don't well, see how that's not possible. It's, just... yeah, like, it, it's no different than having like an ant farm, right? Like, you, all right, you didn't necessarily create the ants, but you can predict what they're going to do. You can, you can, there's all sorts of things. You can't control all of their movements, but if you put a new tube into a new environment, like, are they all going to go there? Probably. <laughs> there's well, certain things you can predict, and there's certain things, yeah, you're right, you can't predict. You, you don't know what every last person is going to do like especially the serial murderer or something like that but yeah i agree totally but i would go further and say that god because of who he is can predict every single ant trail every single hair on our head but that's you know what molinism is right molochism what uh, molinism <laughs> no so what you just described is yet another doctrine and it's called Molinism. It was it was it was created by uh, uh, a Jesuit priest called uh, De Molina was his last name. He created Molinism. Uh, do, are you aware of the um, Christian philosopher William Lane Craig? I've heard the name. Yes, he's one of the most famous Molinists that there are. Molinism says. You know, the, the, the argument that we're having right now, okay, man, free will, let's say free will is, 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 is free will. That, that's there. That's a given. So now, does God know the future or does he not? Well, what Molinism does is it tries to reconcile free will on man's part and foreknowledge on God's part. So what Molinism says is that God knows he doesn't know the future per se, because the future isn't there to know, but he can predict what anyone will do or what everyone will do in every possible situation. And then he can, he can project all of those different combinations of choices that everyone's going to make every moment of their life and and thereby know what the future is that's what molinism says it's very complicated um but it's an attempt to join man's free will and god's foreknowledge and it's 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 a good attempt to do it because at least molinism understands that those two things can't live together you, god just even though he's god and by the way, God doesn't need to know what shirt you're going to wear tomorrow. He doesn't have, it's not necessary for him to know that. It's not going to affect his plan. Whether you get saved or not is not even going to affect God's plan. If God's plan was to set up the new covenant so that, so that Christ would die on the cross for the sins of the world and whoever believes uh, will get saved, that's all that's necessary. God doesn't have to even know who gets saved or how many children you might or might not have. Yeah, but I, I really feel like you're just completely speculating on all of this. Sure. So why are we, I don't want to keep talking about it if we're just speculating. We could do that all night. It's not <laughs> that, you know, you say I'm speculating, but all I'm doing is not going beyond what's written. That's my point. Well, right. But I mean, you know, he had men of God. He had holy men write down things thousands of years before they occurred, which all occurred 100% correctly multiple times throughout history, sometimes hundreds of years, sometimes thousands, sometimes within a decade or two. 
Mm -hmm. And it always happened the way he said it was going to, but you say he doesn't know what's going to happen. And well, I mean, let it's, me, it's, let me stop you for a moment. If you would, let me ask you a question regarding what you just said. So, so he had men write down things that were going to happen. So I have a question. Those things that were going to happen, were they just going to happen and God knew that they were going to happen or did God say what's going to happen and make it happen? Because there's a really big difference there. And well, your answer is very important. So did he just know what free men were going to do and say, I'm predicting the future? Or did he want these things to happen and then work through men to make them happen? What do you think? Because the way you're making it sound was just like, men were going to go do the things that they want to do, and God predicted the future, and he had men write it down. Because that would be one thing. That would be God literally predicting the future of <clears throat> free will beings. I don't think men are that smart. Right. <laughs> but on the other hand, if God said, this is going to happen, and then told the prophet to write it down, what's really happening here is God declaring, that's what it says in Isaiah, I declare it and then I do it. So God says, I will do my will. So when God does his will, that's making the prophecy that he told the prophet to write down, that's making it happen. So God is literally saying, I'm not going to predict what you free will people are going to do willy nilly. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to make happen and I'm going to write it down. And when it does happen, you'll know that I am God. Yeah. But the problem is that you don't have any more proof that it's that way than I do that it's the other way. No, I mean, we could sit here all night and talk about it, but we can't prove it either way. No, the scripture says I will do it. I declare it and I will do it. Sorry, I'm just not there with you. Yeah, I mean, that's okay. I'm, but, you know. I mean, yeah, I totally believe he has intervened and still does in history to do things that he mm -hmm. wants. But, God, to make him so small that he doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I, yeah. I, you say that's big, but that's not big. That's small. Oh, I see it the opposite. I I, when, I, when I came to understand this and and I, and I watched a lot of pros and con videos on it. And uh, it actually made God way bigger than I had had him pictured. Because I had him pictured in this box that he knew the past, present, future. And to me, that's just another form of Calvinism now. Well, I don't agree with that either. No. Um. But that's how I seen it. And right. it took me a long time, <laughs> a long time to come to that. What's, what's his name? Uh, oh, oh, that teaches that. He does a lot of videos on it. Well, but he's an that? open theist. There's um, not, you're talking about Greg Boyd? Yeah, yeah. But I like the way he teaches. Yeah, Greg Boyd is um, one of the, I mean, he grates on my nerves sometimes the way he, he's got all this nervous energy and this talks too fast. Um, but, but he does, when he was younger, I liked some of uh, the videos that he did. Mm. Does he give it, I can't remember now, it's been a while since I watched, does he give an allowance for prophecy? Or is he completely open theist? No, he's not completely. Bob Enyard is one who's like completely open theist, but um, okay. uh, Greg Boyd would definitely say that God um, made things happen. Would especially. he call himself a partial open theist? No, it, that's just a term that I, that I think I coined um, yeah. because I, I, I was getting accused of, you know, like, yeah. like Zach would always come on and say, well, what about the cross? I'd be like, well, of course the cross was predestined. There was lots of things predestined. Mm -hmm. But if, if the Bible says that certain things were predestined, it's heavily implied 
that a lot of things weren't. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what's the point? You know, that's what prophecy is. So I had to come up with the term partial because I fully admit and see in the Bible where God said, I'm going to make this happen. You know, that's a big God. See, a big God, I believe God could predestine everything. And he could totally remove free will and make everybody do every little thing that he wanted them to do for all of eternity. And I believe God could create infinite amounts of universes. I mean, that's a big God. So I don't understand this notion that if God decides to give you a free will, in the very decision to give you the free will, the very definition of free will is not knowing what you're going to do. I don't if agree. You, if God knows what you're going to do, then what you're going to do must be written in stone somewhere. It must be a given. You cannot do no. anything other than that. <laughs> So how else would God know it? No, that's your box. That's your box. You're saying. I can see what you're saying, David. I can God see can't saying. know it, but also let you make the choices to get there. Mm -hmm. you, you're, you're the one saying it's restricting. I'm being open to the possibility that God's big enough to allow both things, which we can't understand because we are finite human beings. Right, right. And maybe if I had little wind-up toys and I had created these wind-up toys so I knew exactly how they worked and I let them all run. There's a lot of scriptural, I mean, there's a lot of scriptural evidence. I mean, here's one. So God tests Abraham and then he says to Abraham, now I know. So somebody could turn around and say, well, you know, God was just saying that for our sake. You know, I love, I mean, I really love that. No, it says, God said to Abraham, now I know. Heavily implying that I wasn't quite sure if you were going to do exactly what I wanted you to do. If you were going to put the knife to your son's throat and actually do it. But now I know. So I'm saying, you want proof? Keep reading. You'll find things like that over and over and over again, where God why would God portray himself as someone who didn't know the future? Because that's what he does in the Bible. I'm just going by what's written. Can anybody speak to that? Amen, brother. Well, I find it an interesting concept for sure. You know, like, I don't believe when, when, when God was looking for Adam in the garden and God said, Adam, where are you? I don't believe that God didn't know where Adam was. Of course he did. You know, that would be ridiculous. But um, things like now I know or let me go down and see what's going on. Like, why did God write those things? Or, had, or why are they written in the Bible? You know, like, at the very least, that's the way God wants you to think of him. You know, biblically. Well, I mean, now I'm looking at that scripture and the reality is it's talking about the angel of the Lord. It's not talking about God, the father. In that passage, verse 11 of chapter 22. Hey, wait, let me go. 
let me go there as well. So you see this as just the angel of the Lord, not knowing, but God knew. The angel of the Lord is the one speaking. Mm -hmm. Right. Can you read it out loud? So when God tested Abraham, he already knew what he would do. Verse 10, Abraham stretched forth his hand, took the knife to slay his son, and the angel of the Lord called to him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything to him, for now I know that thou fearest God. He even refers to God in the third person. Mm -hmm. That's not God. Seeing right. thou hast not withheld thine son, thine only son from me. So then he finds the ram. Right. So, but what you're saying is that the, this angel of the Lord, who was, you know, obviously operating for God here. I mean, some people say that the angel of the Lord is God, but I don't know about that. It's a, it's a, you see that phrase happen a lot, angel of the Lord. But you're saying that the angel of the Lord didn't know, like God was going to test Abraham, but then the angel comes down and says, now I know. That's kind of odd. Well, I just read it out of the Bible. <laughs> Didn't the, wasn't the angel of, wasn't the angel of the Lord sent by the Lord? Sure. So you're saying God knew, but the angel didn't? I can't presume to know, but it sounds like that's the case, since that's what he says. Yeah, I don't know. I think that would be kind of weird. So God knew what Abraham was going to do. So you think God sent the angel and but said, he, hey, I want you to, to tell Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. But when he does it, I want you to stay his hand. And the reason I'm going to have you stay his hand, because I know he's not going to do it anyway, or, or wouldn't withhold his son anyway. So go ahead and do this for me. As opposed to just telling the angel, go do these things for me, which I'm commanding you. I mean, that's a presumption you can make, but I mean, text doesn't say that. So when it says that God tempted Abraham and said to him, so now it's in, in, verse, in verse one, it's God who's saying to him, uh, take, take your son and your only son. So, so God is testing Abraham here. Right. But God knows already what Abraham's going to do. Why not? It doesn't say that, but... There's no Why, reason to think he can't know that. Is it, isn't it an implication that because God's testing him that he doesn't know for sure? He has to test him? Well, if he didn't know, then he would essentially be thwarting his own plans for all the prophecy he, he'd given Abraham, Moses, Adam, all these guys before this. So, yeah, he knew. This is the lineage. This is the lineage of Christ.
Okay. Yeah, I just don't see it that way. I gotta say, even though it's even though it does say the angel of the Lord, to me, this is a messenger of God. Um, God sends messengers like go and find this out. There, you know, I don't have a lot. Of, I don't have. There are a lot of. Believe me, there are a lot of scriptures. I don't know if you've ever like watched any debates on this or read any books on it or articles, but um, I, I haven't recorded all the verses, but it's pretty uh, extensive. You know, like, uh, like Greg Boyd, like we were just talking about, huge book on the topic with verse after verse after verse. You know, really like he took years to, to, to put this stuff down we haven't even, you haven't even touched the beginning of it yeah i mean there's just a lot I, I you know to me like i've been convinced of it for a long time and when i read the bible i to me it it makes god um very personal very relational it doesn't it doesn't diminish god in my mind it really doesn't because i know god can do anything he wants to do literally he can do anything um but he can't make a rock that's too big that he that, that that he can lift that he can't lift it that's the whole point you know that that's like the conundrum there you know god can't stop being god there are some things that god can't do god can't not be love bible says he's love bible says god can't lie you know so in what you guys are saying is, hey, God can just do anything because he's God, period. So that does that mean he can lie? No, the Bible says he can't lie. Can he stop being God? No, apparently, you know, obviously he can't stop being but that's God. That's not, you're, you're making a parallel that's not there between what we're saying or what I'm saying. I'm not saying any of those things, but yet you're making that equivalent to what I'm saying. No, no, I'm so not that's saying not that's a good a, argument. I'm not saying that that's what you're saying. I'm just using it as a point. Like there you're are still some saying things that God, if he knows the future, mm -hmm. is not truly God. And I'm sorry, that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever based on what we've read so far, what we've talked about. I just can't go there. No, that's fine. If you it's... give me some sources, maybe I'll, maybe I'll look at some information, but I, don't, I haven't seen it even start to take shape yet. Well, I, like I say, you know, I, I looked into this years ago. It's what I believe now. I didn't write down all the verses, uh, you know, so I don't have them all to spout out. Um, but, but they are there, you know, they're, they're very convincing when they're, when they're presented, um, you know, and, you know, you should look into it just for the, you know, cause you, we all look, you know, you seem like the kind of guy that looks into you and Alan that looks into everything, whether you believe it or not, you want to find out and know, um, know the deal on it. So I'm sure you'll be looking into it. You know, then you'll, you'll decide, you'll hear it from somebody who, who really has studied it. There's quite a couple of debates on it. Um, Is there a name for what we're talking about? It's basically open theism. It says here there are 39 pas passages that explicitly state that God changed his mind in response to a new development after he'd already announced his plan to go into a certain direction. Yeah, I never, uh, arg I never argued that he n didn't do that. Right. So never. too, there are over 200 places in the biblical narrative that reflects a change in God's plan without explicit explicitly stating it. The question is, how can God change his mind in response to new developments, if his mind is eternally certain of all that shall come to pass. Or even that he knows the future. How does he change his mind if he knows the future? I mean, that, well, that is a good point. That's a good point. No, like I always say, like if God repents one time, then he can't know exhaustively the, the future because changing his mind kind of like Kind of shows that he's operating in time you know like okay let me let me change direction here it's a, he says here god is sometimes surprised by the way things unfold unfold oh that's a lot yeah that happens yeah. a lot but he shows a lot of emotion too he's either surprised or he's upset or he's grieved uh 
the Lord sometimes seeks for things he doesn't find. That's true. Held out my hand all day long to an obstinate people. You know, like I thought. He I, sought for anyone who would repair the wall but found no one. Um, so there's a lot on it. It's an interesting subject to uh, research anyway, for sure. If you read all those verses, though, and you, and you don't want to take them as, you know, proving open theism, then you have to kind of explain them away and, and say something like, well, that's just what God wants us to think. Or I, I don't know what other argument you could possibly have, but I've heard that one. Like, that's just for, you know, for us. God really did know. Or God really wasn't, you know what the Calvinist says? This is interesting. I know we're not Calvinists. Zach uh, signed off. But the Calvinist has this doctrine called uh, impassibility. And God is impassable. It basically means that because he predestined everything and therefore knows the future, he's not really affected by it in any way, shape, or form, not even his emotions. So you can't change God's emotions. So every time you read in the Bible that like God's grieved or he's upset or he's angry, that's just written, you know, kind of like either for the narrative or for your benefit, something like that, you know? But that's impassibility in Calvinism. So I can't help but think like, even the way, the way that I used to think, where I used to think God knew the future exhaustively, now I kind of say, how could I have thought that? Because I'm kind of like accepting some of the things that the Calvinist says about God being outside of time, knowing the future, but yet at the same time we have free will. You know, it's you know, to me I have a hard time putting that together. But I'm not surprised by, you know, anyone saying, well, you're diminishing God. Not, definitely not surprised by that. Because, yeah, it's like when you say God can't do something, you know, it's like, oh, what do you mean God can't do something? He's God, you know. I've heard that uh, fairly often. But, yeah, it is an interesting uh, topic. You have to, <clears throat> you have to claim that all these scriptures that, you know, about God changing his mind and doing all of these things. Um, I, I don't know. It just, it seems logical to me now, I guess. Not that God has to be logical, but. Sometimes to me, logical, logical is important because I think God I think logic is very important in, in theology because God is logical. But for me, the main factor is what does it say and how does it read? Like to me, that trumps everything. And then if, if it's logical, which I, which I believe it is, then now it's like, to me, that's the, that's the nail. You know, this is the way it reads. It makes sense. I believe it. Like, you know, I can't help it. Here's, I'll put a, these guys asked some, this just a question and answer thing. I'll put it in the chat. Or I guess I'll put it in Discord. Eh? Yeah. There's so many things under here. What, uh, what should I put it under here? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I never know. I would never remember. There's so many things to look into. What are the topics? You could put under Calvinism. Calvinism. Okay, free will. I think I had sent you, Lori, uh, a lecture that Greg Boyd did. He was very young. It was a long time ago. And he gave a talk on it. And uh, it's oh, my favorite so Greg many. Boyd. It's my favorite Greg Boyd video. 
It's probably in here somewhere then. You would have posted it. No, it would, I, would have, I gave it to you, I think, a long time ago. So it's not going to be anywhere close to uh, you know, where you can scroll and find it. But uh, he's very young. He looks like he's t talking to a, a, a class of some kind. Could be in college. But he goes over a lot of verses and, and gives a very good uh, case. There's somebody else that I was wa I watched quite a bit of too, but I can't remember who it is. I send you a video on this one guy with gray hair, and he and he talks about the power model, and he says, "Well, God, oh, you know, oh, God yeah, knows he was interesting too." Yeah, he says, "If God knows the future, how does He know the future?" There's two models. One is the power model, and yeah, that was quite good. One is the foreknowledge. He says, God, does the Bible teach that God just knows the future, period? Or does the Bible teach that God has the power to make something happen? And he, and he gives a lot of verses, uh, and he has a syllabus that you can go online and read the verses too, that show that God literally says, I'm going to make this happen, and then he makes it happen. So that's the power model. And that's the reason he knows what's going to happen, because he says, I'm going to make this happen, and he does it. If no one can thwart God's will, that's, that's what it means. It means God's will is to do this and no one can stop him. It's not like God just, you know, knows uh, the future, whatever, however you want to define that. There was a good uh, debate with um, James White and uh, somebody Sanders, I forget his first name. Oh, uh, yeah, and I didn't care for, I think I, he was a young guy, wasn't he? No, he wasn't too young. He's just a thin guy. He wasn't very good at debating, though. He's, well, he's a very timid guy, but the thing is, the substance of what he said, I thought was really good. I don't know where it would even be, because um, it's not under here. It would be pretty easy to find. I could find it here, wait. Um, Who was saying we should knock out some of these topics and put them together? Oh, that's Albert. Oh. <laughs> White versus Sanders. Yeah, there it is. It's does God know the future? White versus Sanders. I hmm. thought it was a very good debate. And James White was very cordial, which was surprising. Yeah, he's not usually that polite. <laughs> because Sanders is so, Sanders is such a nice guy, you know. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Now there's another guy who I'm not crazy about, Jesse Morrell. Mm. He de he defines open theism very well. If you want to listen to some of Jesse Morrell, I just don't like some of his other doctrines. How do you spell his last name? Jesse. M O R R E L L. First thing that comes up, Jesse Morrell, false teacher. <laughs> but yeah. then I guess we'd all be called false teachers, so. Oh, open theism is for sure heretical. Yeah. You Why? I'm not sure. It's quite interesting. <laughs> that it would even be called heretical, hey? You know, when you think about it? It's just not fathomable by most yeah. Christians that God doesn't know what, you know, free will. Well, I don't think it was really fathomable. Well, actually, no, that's not true. I kind of, I really took to the doctrine right away. I didn't, I mean, I, I still kind of sit on a fence with it, but... I definitely go more that way than the other way now. Here's sure. the, interest, the interesting thing is like James White, you know, full-blown Calvinist. He did a debate with Michael Brown a long time ago about uh, free will. And what James White, I'll never forget it. What James White said to uh, Michael Brown is, 
he said, the only consistent Arminian, but he really meant non-Calvinist by Arminian. He meant anybody who doesn't believe in Calvinism. He said, the only consistent Arminian is the open theist. <laughs> and the reason what he meant was, if you're going to believe in free will <clears throat> and be consistent, you must be an open theist because you can't have foreknowledge and free will. They don't jive. So Calvinists admit that at least they believe that the reason God knows the future is because he predestines all of it. And if he didn't predestine all of it, then the Calvinists would say... So they're consistent that way, you mean? They're consistent that way. The Calvinists would say, if, he, if God didn't predestine it, how could he know it? But it's a non-issue for them because they, they believe God predestined everything. Well, that's what Zach was pointing out earlier, right? Right, right, right. <clears throat> yeah. Oh my gosh, it's snowing here, you guys. That is disgusting. First snow, huh? Yeah. And it is coming down. What's the date today? August 7th, October. Well, sure glad I don't have to shovel. Well, I think I'm going to sign off, you guys. Yeah, me too. It's getting late, so. Yeah. Spirited uh, debate, Alan. It was great. I loved it. Enjoy it. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, no, I, I hope you don't think I'm a heretic, but look into it. You you know, you at least know. You're a serpent. <laughs> no, no, don't. I don't want you to take me the wrong way. But I'm, I will consider. I will definitely, I, I, I want to know the truth. You know me. And uh, so I will search it out. You know what, Alan? You have no idea how exciting it is to actually hear somebody say that. Right. I, I had a Christian say to me a couple weeks ago, I'm not into doctrine. <laughs> yeah. See, I love doctor. I love because there's only one truth. God is truth and his word is perfect. So. No, I agree. You hear everybody running around now saying, my truth, my truth. Yeah. <laughs> I want to always remain teachable, you know? Yeah. It's sometimes yeah. hard when you get some biases, but. What's that? It's sometimes difficult when you have some strong biases, but uh, if you base it on your word, on the word and what you understand. Then... Well, it's sometimes I think it's hard to, uh, st you know, stretch your tent, right? Like it's, we, we can, it's very, I think it's very easy to get stuck in a, in a paradigm of beliefs. And this is, this is what I believe. And, that's all I'm going to believe. Well, I mean, I remember before I believed that, that Jesus returned in 70 AD, that if you would have told me that 10 years <laughs> ago, 20 years ago, I'd been like, <laughs> you lost your, your marbles. You're crazy. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, I think it makes you more open once you come out of, once you come out of that, that belief system. Mm -hmm. Because how could you have been, believe that for so that's many true. years it's true it's like well what else am i wrong with <laughs> yeah exactly i would say my whole, almost my whole belief system has changed alan what do you well i i think we may have talked about this before but what do you think about hell because that's another thing that i totally changed on when i when i you know looked into it eternal well, conscious I, torment i should say no see i've always and i guess because of just who I believe God is. I just, I, I can't see a, a infinite punishment for a finite crime. I don't right, see eternal right. torture. That just doesn't, I see annihilation. Now that we agree on. Yeah. So, and what would, what would the purpose be, right? Should, exactly. it, it's not going to make the person saved or repent. It's just going to, just for the sole purpose of torturing them forever. Right. Even us humans know that that's wrong. You know what I'm saying? torturing someone forever you know and god's so much above us so 
yeah, I just, I don't see, I see that the being annihilated is forever. You're not coming back. You know what made me start to think about the hell doctrine is getting out of dispensationalism because when I realized that the 70 AD destruction was mainly what Jesus was talking about, then, then I knew what Gehenna was. Because that's really where you get the, the doctrine of hell from. It's not Paul. Paul doesn't teach on hell. It's Jesus. But right. he, it's not hell. It's Gehenna. You know, once you know Gehenna was, what, what he was referring to was uh, 70 AD, then the destruction of Jerusalem and the fire, then uh, you start to think, well, then what is hell? <laughs> Right. But yeah, I mean, it it takes a lot to get you out of that. You, we were taught in church that you know people burn in hell forever because they reject the gospel. Doesn't even well, make sense. That's what most street preachers. Oh, absolutely. Do. What's his name? Preaches that. Uh, and really. Uh, it's just, it's doing a disservice because it's just, it doesn't even make sense to believe that. But we believed it. Were you going to say Paul Washer? No, oh, I don't know about him. Uh, no. Oh. He's always talking to people on the street. That's his ministry on YouTube. Kerrigan Skelly. Oh. Anyway. Yeah, yeah Kerrigan Skelly is, is like Jesse Morrell. They are um, holiness uh right. preachers they they really uh focus on you know you you have to be completely holy yeah the cleveland street preacher also very much lordship to lordship salvationism yes i'm trying to talk my son through that he listens to a lot of that But at least he's he's kind of still teachable. At least that's good. Once once you get into that doctrine, though, that's a tough one to get out of. That fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I am going to sign off anyway. Uh, yeah, me too. Great, great talk. Yeah, it was really, I, I thought it was good. Hey, guys. Yeah. We'll see All you right. Wednesday. All right. Good night. God bless. Okay, good night. Good night, Albert.